Now, before we start, um, just want to share something real quick. You know, as a uh, as a parent, um, when our kids decide to follow the Lord, you know, it's a, it's a really encouraging thing. It's it's a proud moment for parents. Um, but when they take it to the next level and they start serving, you know, that's something else to be even more proud of. But I tell you what, this morning, I have the privilege of serving alongside my daughter. This is Krista. If you guys don't know her, she will be playing guitar. But she wants to... Uh, grow in her gift and so we're slowly giving her opportunities she's going to sing with me this morning and so uh, she's going to help lead some worship this morning but I, this is a super proud moment for myself and for my wife Vicki you know, to see our kids not just uh, coming to faith but serving and again it's just such an honor to be able to serve alongside of one of my kids Father, we come before you this morning, God, and we just want to uh, lift up our voices and praise God. This morning, we just want to worship you, God, wholeheartedly. Um, no reservations, God. Hands raised, um, contemplating the lyrics, thinking about what we're singing, God. And may you be glorified. You are worthy. You alone are worthy. And so we want to lift up our voices 
in honor and uh, in praise of you. In Jesus' name, amen. There used to be a song years ago, it was called The Lord Reigns, you know, and obviously it's been raining, right? And um, we had a few people that went out to, uh, to pray for those that were thinking about having an abortion yesterday down uh, near Planned Parenthood. 
And Bob says, hey, on Friday, he goes, it's raining. He goes, we need to pray, pray the Elijah prayer where it doesn't, it doesn't rain for three hours, but then after that, the rain clear, the rain comes back. And that's exactly what happened, you know? Yeah. But you know what? When I think of the Lord reigns, I also think of he rains blessings down on us. And he also wants to reign on us in the sense that I was thinking about this morning, um, Elder Bob was doing a Devo on the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is what God wants to do in the life of every believer, because that's what Jesus does. It's love, it's joy, it's peace, it's patience, it's kindness, it's goodness, it's faithfulness, it's gentleness, it's self-control. That's what God wants to infuse in the life of every believer. And Jesus says, the way you do this is you abide in me. And in John chapter 15, verse 1 through 8, he talks about abiding in me and you will bear fruit. And it's interesting, if you look at that passage, there's like four groups of people. First, there's those who don't bear fruit. Those who don't bear fruit, he goes, it's like they just take the, the, the branches off and they throw it in the fire. Their life is actually good for nothing because that's not what God created them for. But then there's some that bear fruit. And then Jesus says, those that bear fruit, I prune that they would bear more fruit, which is what God wants to do. And so many times we start bearing fruit and God prunes and he does a couple things in our life that kind of hurt and all of a sudden we just want to back off. But God wants us not to just bear more fruit. He wants us to bear much fruit. See, he doesn't want us to bear no fruit. He does want us to bear fruit. He wants us to bear more fruit. Then he wants us to bear much fruit. And it finishes with saying, he who abides in me and I am him. It says he'll bear much fruit. But then it says, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. And then he says, and this has, uh, is how my father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and you will be my disciples. And guys, I am just saying, God wants every one of us to bear much fruit that we would be his disciples. And we're going to learn about a man who finished well. His name is Jacob. He was in that first category. He wasn't bearing no fruit. Then he started to bear some fruit, and then God started pruning him, and he kind of backed off. But then he just kept moving forward, and then he bore more fruit. And as he finishes his life, he is bearing much fruit, as you're going to see. So I just want all of us to know there's encouragement in the Lord. The more we stay close to him, he wants to rain his blessings on us. And he wants to water us to our weak and bear fruit for his glory. So let's dedicate this service to the Lord. If you bow in your heads, in your, bow in your heads. Bow with your heads in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for what Jesus does. He not only saves our soul, he then sanctifies it, which means he sets us apart to do great things for him. And Lord, we can't do that of ourselves. We can only do that with your help as we stay close to you. So, Lord, we're here this morning. We're here to hear from you. We're here to offer our praises and worships to you because you are worthy. And so we pray you bless everything that takes place here today. Be magnified in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.
is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. Jesus, your name is the highest. Stay standing as, uh, well, looks like I lost my paper here. <laughs> as we have uh, Maribon come and read some scripture for us. Yeah. Good morning. Okay, we're going to be reading um, in Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9. Um, the passage is about the commands that God has given to the children of Israel who were about to come into the promised land. These commands was a gift from God stating that if they kept it, they will be blessed from generations to generations. So verse 1, it says, Now this is the commandment. It's pretty long, <laughs> so bear with me. Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God had commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you and you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord with all your God, your, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. You shall be as front they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doors doorpost of your house and on your gates. And um Verse 4 through 9 really stuck out to me because um, it's one of those scriptures that um, you check, you put a check mark whenever you read the scriptures. Sometimes you're just like, it's like a mirror, like Matthew, the book of Matthew says. You put a check mark, you're like, in my Proverbs 31, you go through the list, you know, you put a check mark and what, what you actually do and where um, you meet that standard. And um, it's not that we have to do. In, you know what God wants you to do 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 it's actually me wanting to please God 
you know. And um, it's uh, in these related scriptures that reassures me that even though my husband and I work full time and um, are busy, 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 and I feel guilty that I'm not in the mission fields or I'm not out there with uh, Pastor Joe and Cheryl, you know, um, in the homeless ministries. And um, the Lord reminds me that it, um, my home is, in the moment of time, my husband and I's mission field. And I, as I read the list that, um, of what my husband and I should be teaching our children, I felt a sense of joy, um, putting a check, <laughs> check mark, um, because I, I married a man who relentlessly speaks the word um, to our children with me whenever a chance we get. I drop off the kids to school, he picks up, and um, we continually talk about the word of God. He, he didn't know what I was going to talk about today, but... On our way here, he does the verse of the day um, with the, his group of men. And I thank you for doing that men's um, um, trip because he's been on it. <laughs> and um, <laughs> thank you. And um, he was just talking about the parables today. And I'm just like, oh, God, you're so good. And, um, and sooner, like, we, we have to... Uh, my husband and I agree that we are raising God-fearing adults and not children. And sooner than later, our kids will be off to college. And depending on the college they choose, they dis and dis um, we decided to equip them with God's word. Because of most of these colleges do their best to indoctrinate. I appreciate the um, class that Pas Pastor Marty is uh, going to open up with um, Brother Bart. Um, it's the citizen, the biblical citizenship. So if you're interested, that'd be great, you know. Um, it, it's going to have, um, it, it would emphasize the biblical worldview of the, uh, as far as the government is concerned. And just as Pastor Rick mentioned a few Sundays ago, is that Jesus, it's Jesus who can save this country. Our country was built around biblical principles in that that's, why it's so much better than many country I know, and hopefully Jesus can save it. When Benjamin Franklin was asked what kind of a government this new government's going to be, he responded, it's a republic if you can keep it. And coming back to the scripture, God gives his promises in Deuteronomy to, to you of, um, of a fruitful life in gener from generation to generation. This is his commandment if you can keep it. And so when you're preaching to your family, even your grandkids and your kids, or even if you don't have kids, there's room at the children's ministry to teach the other kids. And we're doing Haven right now, and my husband was just, he's a, he's a, he has a gift of teaching, and he did such a good job. And um, just teach, teach the word God. Amen. All right, you guys can have a seat. Good morning, church. Um, if there's anybody that's new here, we have a connect table in the back. It has a bunch of information on it. We have our tithing box. We have connect cards. We'd really like to connect with you guys, so please fill a card out. There's many resources back there, so please go check it out. Wednesday night Bible study. We have Bible study every Wednesday night. Y'all know that, right? 7 o'clock here at the library. It's awesome. You should come. It's a great time of prayer. We need prayer more than ever. Um, save the date. The Women's um, Passion Week study is coming, and Lori did it last year, and it was an amazing time. You women that haven't gone, please um, find the time to come. It starts February 15th. You will not be disappointed. The Grieving Moms Study meets every Tuesday night, and I believe they're, it meets Tuesday night at 7 o'clock, and I believe they're going to meet in, up until um, the, probably the middle of March, and you can see Brendel Thomas for that. The Called Young Adult Ministry, they're having a hike day this Saturday, the 27th, at Sycamore Canyon. You can see Gary or Alicia for that. And the Men's Discipleship meets this Thursday evening. Men, make sure you go. It's the, at the Calvia's home, right? And then you'll all be happy to hear your tithing statements are ready. So don't maul me. 
I'll be in the back over there um, at a table so you guys can come and pick it up after church. And with that, Remnant and Haven, you're dismissed, and everybody get up and greet someone you don't know.
Amen. Hey, if you got your Bibles, we are going to be in Genesis 49. We're going to read a few verses. Remain standing, please, as we always honor God's Word. Genesis 49, title of message is A Father's Love to the End. A Father's Love to the End. Genesis 49. You guys there? All right, well, I'm going to start reading. Genesis 49. And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, you shall not excel. Because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly, for in their anger they slew a man. And in their self-will, they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. Father, as we come and look at this story, if you will, of Jacob finishing and telling his children, his sons behind him, after him, what's to come upon them and to point them to you, Father. I pray as I share your words, uh, they would not be mine. They would be yours. We pray you would increase, I would decrease. And Lord, as Jesus are often say, give us ears to hear what your spirit would say in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I was looking at famous last words, and they're all over the map, different people. Harriet Tubman, the great uh, um, woman who was with the Underground Railroad in slavery, I go to prepare a place for you. She was quoting the words of Jesus. Frank Sinatra, his big hit was, I did it my way. He said, I'm losing. Whitney Houston said, I'm going to go and see Jesus. Conrad Hilton, the guy who owns Hilton uh, Hotels, this is what he said, leave the shower curtain on the inside of the tub. That sound like a guy that works a little too hard, maybe? Amy Winehouse, famous pop star who was known to struggle with drugs and alcohol, she says, I don't want to die. W.C. Fields was known for being a notorious alcohol drinker and just a blasphemer. Well, on his deathbed, supposedly, he had a Bible with him. And they were asking, what are you reading that for? He goes, I'm looking for loopholes. I'm looking for loopholes. Leonardo da Vinci, the great artist, this is what he said. I've offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. Wow, talk about an overachiever, huh? That guy wanted to, to do his best. Karl Marx, he's the, he's the father of Marxism and, and anti-God philosophy. Go on, get out. Last words are for fools who have not yet said enough. Really? Talk about fools, he's, he's already found out. Buddha, of all pe people. Behold, old monks, this is my advice to you. All component things in the world are changeable. They are not lasting. Work hard to gain your, salva your own salvation. I'm so glad we don't have to work hard, right? Jesus did it all. Bob Marley said, money can't buy life. Doesn't matter how famous you are or how much money you have, he's right. Mother Teresa, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Joan Crawford, popular actress who was known to not really like the things of the Lord. She uses a cuss word and says, don't you dare ask God to help me when she heard her housekeeper praying for her. Jack Daniels, you know he's a famous for, right? This is his last words. One last drink, please. Wow, that's what you're known for. Tupac Shakur, he had got murdered. He got killed, and the police officer came to him trying to find out, and he just basically gave him an explicative and then took his last breath. Pancho Villa, 
don't let it in like this. Tell him I said something. <laughs> I thought, wow, you know. So Jacob is here. He's gathering to give his last words. And his last words are, I basically care about my, my family after me, and I want to share the things of the Lord with them. And so in verse 49, he calls his sons together, and he, just like the, he brought the sons of, of Joseph in the last chapter and blessed them, he wanted to bring these sons before him, and he wanted to talk to them. And you know, the patriarchs, the leaders, would always bless their children. They would always pass on their faith, and that's what Jacob is doing. And this, what we're reading is a very similar passage in uh, the book of Deuteronomy 33 where Moses was talking to the people uh, and he was telling them about the 12 tribes of Israel. And you know, we as parents, we should love and appreciate our kids and we should communicate the value that we have and that value that they have and even the special gifts they have and encourage them. But most importantly, we need to point them to the Lord. You know, recognize their their gifts and their talents because a lot of times they don't hear that. We need to tell him that. In verse 2, he says, Gather together in here. And if you are a father, especially a Christian, gather your children together and speak truth and wisdom and love to them. I love what Maribon just shared about her family, that they're doing that. And I know many of you are doing that. This is the thing, dads. You are the number one influence in the lives of your family. The number one. A few years ago, a couple of uh, NBA stars, um, I think it was Carl Malone, and I think it was... Um, Oh, gosh, what's his name? The other guy. The big guy that used to play for the 76ers, Charles Barkley. They said something, you're a role model to our kids. And one of them said, I'm not a role model to your kids. Your father is your role model. In one sense, he was right. In one sense, he's wrong. Everybody is a role model, especially when you're in front of people. You're a role model. All the kids will look up to you. But he brought a good point. The father is a role model. See, when God talks to... uh, talks about raising kids he talks to the fathers the church doesn't raise your kids we're here to support and help you a christian school doesn't raise your kids they're to support and help you a public school definitely doesn't raise your kids culture doesn't raise your kids dads you are the number one guy that god has put in charge and this is what it says in ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 and you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath but bring them up and bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. That means you're responsible to discipline them and correct them when they go wrong. We're also responsible to educate them and tell them what's right and what is wrong and to teach them and lead them in those ways. And the wives, the moms are to come alongside them. Sadly, it's usually the mom that's doing this and it shouldn't be that way. It should be like a partnership. The husband kind of oversees it, but he has, they both have their part. I just love what Maribon was sharing. That was really beautiful right there. And you know, if you have kids at home, some of us, our kids are out of the home. Spend time with them. Do devotions with them. Share the the Bible with them. Uh, Read a Bible verse. Just talk about it with them. And and the Bible talks about, it says in in, uh, Deuteronomy, to as you sit down and as you lie down and rise up and as you walk about through life, use that as opportunities just to talk to them. But notice what it says, and listen to Israel, your father. Notice he goes back to the father. And it says, this is what's interesting, is gather together and hear you sons of Jacob and listen to Israel your father see his given name was Jacob but then God changed it to Israel and what he's saying is I come to you as a Jacob but I want you to remember me as an Israel I want you to see that this is where I started but I want you to see this is where I finished and people should be able to look at our lives and say okay I've learned from my mistakes when I was a Jacob I was self-sufficient I was prideful, I was deceptive, I was carnal, but God got a hold of my life, and now I'm in Israel. I'm a prince with God. I'm humble. I'm, I'm a righteous man. I'm full of love, and I'm a servant to others. Oh, my gosh, I pray that our kids could see that in us, that what I was isn't who I am. This is what I am now, and I'm a follower of the Lord, and I want you to follow me because I want my best for you. That's what a godly parent does. And we have a God-ordained, God-given ordained authority to speak truth into our kids. And that's what he is doing. He's taking this last opportunity to lead them in the path of righteousness for God's namesake. Billy Graham said, The greatest legacy one can pass on to one's children and grandchildren is not money, not money or material things or accumulations in one's life, but rather a legacy of faith. Here's a couple of quotes which are kind of, kind of really weak, actually. Bill Gates, legacy is a stupid thing. I don't want a legacy. Really? 
Hillary Clinton, I don't think about a legacy, I think about my life, because I had quite an unpredictable life. Really. And there's a guy I never even heard of, this guy, I don't, this guy whose name is Victor Belfort, I don't know who he is, but this is what he said. Legacy is not what I did for myself, it's what I'm doing for the next generation. That's actually really healthy. Your life is not about you and what you accomplish. Your life is about what I can put into the people that are behind me. Hopefully we've had a life of character and faith and walking with the Lord, but then the words that we speak, we want to leave on a good note, and that's what Jacob is doing. I'm so impressed. He's, we've, we've been watching Jacob the whole way. He's, he's done this, right? But boy, those last 17 years, he was like this. He was all about the Lord. He, he comes into the land. The first thing he does, he goes and blesses Pharaoh twice. You know, when he starts talking about what God has done for his children. And he doesn't even chastise his children with what they did to Joseph, which I would have thought he would have. At least it's not recorded. But he wanted to focus on what's positive. And, that, and what's positive is following God. And I just love how he finishes with that. And basically what he's, basically what he's going to say, he's going to talk to these 12 kids. We're going to talk about them a little bit. He's basically saying, God blesses those who love and obey him. And what a man sows, that he shall reap. In other words, if you're serving God, you're going to expect some great things. If you're thinking about, if you're all about yourself, you're going to reap what you sow. And that's what he's going to say. So the first one is Reuben. He starts off with the sons of Leah. The very first son was Reuben, and he was called C, a son. Uh, each of these names is really pretty interesting that they would really put thought into the names, and it was actually prophetic. And basically, Leah was saying, see, here's a son. He's, he's trying to win the love of her husband because if we remember the story, uh, he had a couple of wives. Rachel was the one he loved. Leah, he didn't love. So Leah was always trying to win his love. But if you read this passage of Reuben, it's two, it's two halves. The first half is his amazing potential, the expectations of, the, of his role as a firstborn, but the second one is the reality of his life. He starts off like, Reuben, you are my firstborn. Not, you're my might and the beginning of my strength. He's talking about the might that would come from the Lord the excellency of dignity and power and talks about growing in the things of the Lord. That's what he was supposed to be. But then we see what he really is. He goes, you're unstable as water. He goes, you're like a runaway river that you can't control. He goes, you do your own thing, you know? I was thinking about this as I was walking. My wife and I were at Ikea the other day. I'm just kind of thinking of this message. And so she goes, hey, get a cart. So I go get a cart and I start pushing it. It goes to the left. And then I straighten it and it goes to the left. And she goes, you need another guy? No, it's okay. And after about a minute, I go, forget this stinking cart, you know? So I put it in there, and all of a sudden, I'm just, I'm just, the next cart, I'm just putting it with one finger. That's how Reuben was. Every time you try to direct him, it's like, Ugh. you're just constantly correcting. Like, come on, Reuben, follow the Lord. That's not what God, God wants us to be the one that he just gives a, a push, and we're just going in that right direction. But Reuben was unstable as water, and we saw the big sin that he committed. He went into his father's bed and slept with his concubine. Wow. Well, I thought that's bad enough because we know we shouldn't have had a concubine. But what really broke my heart is those are two of your brother's mom. And I thought, man, that is wicked to the core. You know, I remember character is one of the most important aspects of leadership in the Bible. First uh, Timothy 3, Titus, it's all character qualities. And um, I was thinking years ago, we were on a job site and politics was talk being talked about. And we were talking about a former president that was known for a lot of infidelity. And one of the guys says, what's the big deal what he does with his wife? Why, why, are you making, why, why are we make a big deal about that? And I said, dude, if the most closest person to him, his wife can't trust him, how can the people of America trust him? Character counts. Character is huge in God's economy. And if you're gonna be a leader, you gotta have character. And this guy didn't have it. Many great men have been disqualified from God's service because of lust. I saw this in Ecclesiastes, and I thought of him. He who pleases God shall escape from her. That's the immoral woman, but the sinner shall be trapped by her. Spurgeon said, So a man may have great opportunities and let use them. Uncontrolled passions may make him very little, who otherwise might have been great. And that was him. All these expectations, it turns tremendous. This is what sin does. It turns tremendous potential into tremendous pain and disappointment and regret and that was his life then we get these two other guys Simeon and Levi and he talks about the cruelty and the cruelty and violence 
is the same word in Genesis 6 where God says that man had wickedness on his mind continually and it was a violent world and God says, I'm going to judge the world. That's how terrible this was. If you know the story in Genesis 34, these two boys went in and massacred a whole city. They killed all the men in the city because of one man's sin. Yeah, the one guy should have had some punishment, but they took out the whole, the whole city. And, um, you know, basically, God is saying here that he doesn't bless sin. He starts talking about, let not my soul enter their council, let my not honor be united to their assembly. He's basically saying, you guys are not going to be blessed. And Simeon, in the first census, he was the third largest tribe, but in the next census, at the end of the book of Numbers, he was the smallest tribe. And he had no significance the rest of his life. On the flip side is a guy named Levi. Now, Levi, what this was a gem to me, Levi was given grace. Because he says at the very end of verse 7, I will divide them and scatter them. And Levi was divided because he was going to be of the he was going to have the priest come from him. And so he got divided through all the other the all the other uh, tribes. He never had his own land. But I thought about this. When Exodus 32 happened, the sin where the golden calf was made, when Moses went up for the Ten Commandments, he comes down, and they're dancing around the, the golden calf, and Moses just lights them up. What are you guys doing? He goes, whoever's on my side, get over here. It says, all the sons of Levi came to him. No one else did, but Levi did. And then God shined his grace on Levi, Levi and called them to be the priests. Listen to this in Joshua 13, 33. But to the tribe of Levi, Moses had given no inheritance, the Lord God of Israel was their inheritance. And then later on in chapter 18 of Joshua, the Levites have no part among you, talking to, to the other tribes, for the priesthood of the Lord is their inheritance. What they were saying is, Levi, you're going to be blessed because the Lord's your inheritance. You don't need land. You're going to be blessed because you get to serve the Lord. You're not doing other things. And guys, if we could get, get that, that our blessing, the biggest blessing of our inheritance is the Lord, it's a great thing. And then we come to Judah. And Judah's on the positive note. Judah is praise. Judah is praise. It means praise. It literally means praise. And when Leah was naming her kids, when she named this one after the first three, she seemed to be naming them, trying to win her husband's affection. And she got to Judah. She goes, I'm just going to praise the Lord, man. I got four kids, and I'm just blessed. That's kind of was her attitude. And Judah was an absolute blessing. He is the first mentioned and the largest tribe in Numbers chapter 2. When they were supposed to break camp, Judah was always the first. And he had the, biggest, he had the biggest one. He was also the first to take their land in Joshua, headed up by Caleb, who I nicknamed an old man after God's own heart. You guys know the story of, of Caleb? He was 80 years old or something, and 85 years old. He goes, I'm as strong as I was when I was here 40 years ago. We're going to take that mountain. I love that dude, you know? And uh, then when the, um, in the book of Judges, it says, after the death of Joshua, the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, who shall go up to us and fight against the Canaanites? And Judah, and God says, Judah shall go up. I've delivered the land into his hand. So Judah has all of these great things about him. Most importantly, that's where the Messiah comes from. Judah didn't have too good of a start either, if we remember some of his sins, but he turned it around uh, when Joseph, or I'm sorry, when Joseph, as the uh, second in command, was going to hold back his baby brother, Benjamin. And then Judah steps in. I'll, I'll take the blame. I'll take him. You can send him back. And he earned, I believe, God's favor, and God's grace was on him. And it talks about in verse 9 about the lion. And isn't he known as the lion of the tribe of Judah? And then in verse 10, it talks about the scepter shall not depart, a lawgiver, Shiloh. These are all references to the Messiah. The Messiah is going to come. Remember in Christmas... But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And then it goes on in verse 11. It talks about binding his donkey to the vine, his donkey's colt to a choice vine. It just talks about, you know, he's going to have a blessed, fruitful life. But the donkey and the colt, isn't that what Jesus wrote in when he wrote in? And then it talks about washing his garments in wine, his clothes in blood of grapes. That's another reference to the Lord. If you remember, in Isaiah as well as in Revelation, it says he was clothed with a robe dripped in blood. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. God has put Jesus in charge. He is, is going to be the one that's going to judge the living and the dead. 
And he's given that to Judah, or he's given it to the Messiah through Judah. So Judah has all these blessings, but primarily because of the Lord. Then we have this son named Zebulun. Zebulun means dwelling. And this is a, this all of a sudden, Leah almost kind of goes back because Leah has four kids right off the bat. So she thinks she's going to win the, the love of her husband, but it doesn't happen, you know. And then Rachel gets jealous, and she gives a concubine, uh, her, her maidservant, to Jacob. They have two kids. And then Leah gives her concubine, or her uh, maidservant, they have two kids. And then Leah finally just gets back in the game and wants two more of her own. And the first one's dwelling, and she says, that my, now my husband will dwell with me. Kind of like, okay, I've given him this big old group of kids, but... Anyways, Zebulun was a main, was, though he wasn't by the sea, he was a main trade route that came through the land connecting Damascus to the Sea of Galilee in the Mediterranean. They had a good reputation of warriors. They provided the most of all the tribes to give David the kingdom back in 1 Chronicles 12. So there was some good, and they also helped Deborah and Barak beat the Canaanites in Judges 5. Then Issachar, here's another one from uh, Leah. This is her last child. He was known as just being hardworking. It says he became a band of slaves. And maybe you think that they were just more about burdens. They were out tilling the fields and working hard, but that's kind of what they were known for. Um, and then we have another, we have the first one of Rachel's servants, which is uh, Bilhah, and the name is Dan. Now, Dan, Dan was the one that should have been something too, kind of like um, Reuben. It says, Dan shall judge his people. That's where Samson came from. Remember Samson? The he man with the she weakness, you know? This guy had all the potential in the world, but same thing, he gave into the lust of his flesh, and his life got cut short. But then we don't read a whole lot. And then it has this real weird thing. It says, Dan shall be like a... Actually, I didn't even read this. Let's go to verse 13. Zebulun shall dwell by the haven of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships, and his borders shall adjoin Sidon. Issachar is a strong donkey lying down between two burdens. He saw that rest was good and that the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to become a burden and become a band of slaves. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider shall fall backward. Isn't that a weird description? You're like a little snake on the trail that when a horse comes with a guy in it, you bite it so you can drop the, 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 the rider. I'm like, what? Well, one of the things that Dan did was a real wicked thing in uh, Judges 18. They went to this one peaceful people that were all minding their own business, and they came in and they just slaughtered them. And then they raised up some, uh, some guy's kid to be a priest, and they started idolatry up in the hills of Dan. And later, Jeroboam made two golden calves when the kingdom split, and he put one in Dan, and the people from every class would be, become priests and just worship it. And it was just pathetic. And so Dan's left out of some of the, uh, some of the uh, genealogies, and they think it's primarily because of that sin. And then in verse 18, Jacob just pauses and says, I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. It's almost like he's looking at all of his sons, some good, some bad, you know, and he's just like, ay, ay, ay. And it's almost like he just says, Lord, I'm just waiting on your salvation. I'm just... I'm just so grateful that you're taking me out of this place and I have my, my peace with you. And that's really one of the bottom lines of this last declaration with his family is pointing people to the Lord. He just kind of, almost like he pauses. And then he goes and talks about a, a few more of the, of the children. Uh, verse 19, Gad, a troop, shall tramp upon him, upon him and he shall triumph at last. And Gap mean, Gad means troop. And basically, he was on the east side of the Jordan. Everybody was supposed to go on the west side, but Gad and Reuben and the half-tribe of Manasseh stayed on that side. And though originally these guys were rebuked because they're like, why aren't you going with all of God's people? You're dividing the people by the Jordan River. God doesn't want that. And so they had this almost disagreement, but in God's providence, he allowed those two and a half tribes there. Uh, and so Gad even though he originally got rebuked, he kept his promise, and their promise was, we're going to go in the promised land, we're going to fight for all of the other nine and a half tribes, and not until they get their tribes are we coming back. And they were like, oh yeah, sure you are. Well, they actually did. Gad did that. And so also, he was on the outskirts 
over by Jordan, where Jordan is now, he was where all the enemies are, so they were getting attacked all the time. That's why it says, a troop shall tramp on him, and he shall triumph. But he would get a lot of victories in those battles. And then we have Asher. Asher was um, another one of the... Okay, Asher and Gad were both from the maidservant of Leah. And Asher, it says, bread from Asher shall be rich, and he shall yield royal dainties. So it doesn't have a whole lot to say about it, uh, Moses said that Asher is the most blessed of sons. Let him be favored by his brothers and let him dip his foot in oil. And they believed Asher's land was just so fertile and so fruitful that they grew all kinds of crops. And he just kind of lived peaceably up there. And his primary thing was he was happy because he was doing all these crops up there. And then we get this guy, um, another one of Rachel's maidservants. Actually, this one is one of Rachel's maidservants. The first one was Dan. The second one is Naphtali. Is a deer let loose? He uses beautiful words. Um, Naphtali means my wrestling. And this is where um, J, uh, Rachel was naming the kids. Naming this kids. Because I'm, I'm wrestl- I wrestled with God for this kids. Basically what was said. But what does it say about Naphtali? Well, a deer let loose could mean he was living the abundant life. He wasn't held by the traditions of men. He had the freedom... Kind of like we would say, he has freedom in Christ. He's not living under a, a, a burden of self-righteousness. You know, he's just living uh, a life as a, as a Jew, uh, enjoying the religion of the Jews at the time. But Moses said, Oh, Naphtali, satisfied with favor and full of the blessing of the Lord. Then he says he uses beautiful words. And when I heard that, I was thinking about, in Proverbs, it says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So he apparently was known for just saying pleasant and good things. He wasn't known for fighting and arguing with people. But then we get to one of the last guys, or one, not the last guy, but Joseph. Joseph is much like Judah. Six times in this little passage about Joseph, you'll see the word blessed or blessings. And, uh, and it says in verse 22, Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well, his branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. But his bow remained his strength, in, his, in strength. And the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. By the God of your father who will help you. And by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above. Blessings of the deep that lies beneath. Blessings of the breast of the womb. The blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors. Up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills, they shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. God is honoring Joseph because he was separate from his brothers. They all came against him. He paved the way for them all to be rescued in Egypt. And he lived an amazing life as we talked about how many chapters were dedicated to Joseph. And it just talks in the, the beginning about how fruitful he would be. But look in verse 23. The archers have bitter, bitterly grieved him and shot at him and hated him. That would be speaking of enemies. When it talks about the archers, it's usually those that are persecuting you or those that are speaking lies. And I think of his brothers. I think of Potiphar's wife. I think of the butler who didn't stick up for him when he, when he was rescued. I think of others. But it, you know what? It talks about the arrows shooting at him, but it never talks about him shooting back at them. He doesn't take vengeance on his enemies. He just loves the Lord and does the right thing. And that's what it talks about in verse 24. He just, he had a righteous character about him. And then it talks about um, how God's going to bless his offspring. and even talks about some of the names of God. And he, this is what made great, Joseph great in the middle of verse 24. By the hands of the mighty God of Jacob... From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, by the God of your father who will help you and by the Almighty who will bless you. If you remember, the big thing about Joseph, if we would read, the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. Irregardless of all the persecution, all the terrible things we keep reading, the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. And because of that, he had this great blessing. And in, in part of Joseph is the blessing of his two sons, um, Ephraim and Manasseh. And it's interesting, if you look in Hebrews 11.21, that's the hall of faith. The one little verse that talks about Jacob, the only thing it mentions is him blessing these two sons of Jacob, I mean, of Joseph. Like, that was the main thing he was known for. I thought that was interesting. Of all the things he did, that's the thing that got him in the, the hall of faith. 
And Manasseh, if, if you look at the map, the two biggest tribes are Judah and Manasseh. Manasseh is two tribes, because there's an east and there's a west, but it's massive. It's just as big as, um, as uh, Judah. And then Ephraim had the blessing of being the name off in the Old Testament. That would refer to the ten northern tribes. It would always be Ephraim. They call him Ephraim. And Ephraim is where Joshua came from. And Joshua was the one who led him into the promised land and brought him to victory. And then we see this son, Benjamin, verse 27. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. Wow, that sounds pretty, pretty negative, right? Well, Moses actually called him the beloved of the Lord, and he shall dwell, safe, dwell safely by him, by God. So it's almost like he got these two different little stories of, uh, an, of an analogy, or not an analogy, of an evaluation of his life. His tribe was very wicked, if you remember, in the book of Judges, verse chapter 19 and 20. Out of him came the two Saul's, the evil king Saul and the New Testament Saul. And what were they both known for? Persecuting God's chosen people. That's what they were known for, persecuting God's people until they both, well, Saul never changed, the Old Testament Saul, but the New Testament Saul did. But they were both from Benjamin. But it also says they, brave, they fought bravely against their main enemies of Israel in Judges 5. They were the only tribe that was loyal to Judah when the kingdom split. Judah had Jerusalem. That's where God was at, you know. And the ten tribes went north, and, and, and Benjamin hung out and just stuck with him. So it's just interesting, you know, uh, kind of a split testimony of that. And then in verse 28, all these are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is what their fathers spoke to them. And he blessed them. He blessed each one according to his own blessing. That is very, that's where the whole blessing comes back, way back in chapter 12, the, um, er, the um, Abraham blessing. Remember the blessing of Abraham? He says, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to give you the land as you come out from your people. And I'm going to make you a blessing, and you're going to be a blessing. And then by all, and by your descendants, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And that's where Jesus came from. It started with Abraham. But he basically said, I'm going to bless you to be a blessing. And you know what? That's what God calls you and I to do. Have you guys been blessed by the Lord? It kind of sounded a little weak there. Have you guys been blessed by the Lord? Every one of you have been blessed by you, Lord. Every one of you. But some of you, you don't realize it because maybe you're going through trials or you've had disappointments. I'm telling you, God has blessed you. He's blessed you beyond belief. And he's going to take you to heaven someday. And so this is, so listen to it. Yeah. That's worth cheering for, guys. Put yourself on the feet of Jacob. How can we finish strong and have a good legacy? I think he gives us some good pointers here. How about this? Put yourself in the feet of one of his sons. What would cause a future blessing or even worse, a cursing in your life if you were to follow some of these sons? There's a couple lessons there. See, Jacob was afforded the luxury of having all of his children with him when he died. Many of us will not have that opportunity. Some of us, we, we may not see our children before we pass on. They may even die before us. Some of them have children living on the other side of the country. We don't get to see them that often. Some of us may be estranged from our children. But one thing we can do, whether they're with us or not, is we can pray for them. If one of the, look, look how it says in verse 28 at the end of it. And he blessed them, he blessed each one according to his own blessing. And we talked about the last couple of chapters, you would see just Jacob blessing. He, would, he blessed Pharaoh a couple of times. He blessed Joseph and his sons, and he's blessing his sons. And it just talks about blessing. And we talk about that blessing that we see in chapter 6 of Numbers. Remember, uh, Alan came and read that last week? The Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And he told Aaron, when you say this and you bless the children of Israel, my blessing will be upon them. And we talk about how we can actually be a blessing to others by blessing them and praying for them. One thing we can do is we can bless them. Another thing we can do is we can pray for God's will in their life. I'm going to share just a verse really quick that I shared with the men up the retreat. And it's a, a, uh, I heard Charles Stanley teach on this when I was a young Christian. He says, 
as a pastor, he says, if you ever want to know what to pray for me, pray this, pray this. And this is a, this is a verse I think is such an amazing verse to pray that if you don't know what to pray for somebody but you love them and you care about their spiritual health this is an excellent prayer and yes pray it for your pastor because you know what he needs it man do i need it i was expecting to see a bunch of amens but that's okay you just kept it to yourself that's cool i want to share this prayer and i want you on your own to, go, to write it down or not to write to go look in the bible this is a prayer that is a, a blessed, amazing prayer for anybody. This is what Paul prayed for the Colossians. He said, For this reason we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you. And this is his prayer. To ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. And then he gives us a reminder of how important our salvation is and this prayer is. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Great, Marty, but where is it? It's in the Bible. I want you to go find it. No. That's, that, that's mean. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. Amazing prayer. If you never know what to pray for me, please pray that prayer because there's so much power in that. But now, look at verse 29. Um, verse 29, as we close, it, close this. Then he charged them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephraim the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephraim uh, the Hittite as a possession for a burial place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field, the cave that is in, uh, were purchased from the sons of Heth. And when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Wow. He's actually even giving directions about how and where he wants to be buried. I started thinking about this. You know, a lot of times I'll, I'll put a message together. I'm always praying throughout it, but then a lot of times I'll, well, almost pretty much every time, Lord, what exactly are you saying? What exactly do you want me to share with your people? What exactly is the application for this? You guys are still alive, right? Did you guys know you're all alive? Just slap yourself in the face. You're alive. Okay, and God hasn't taken you home yet. And you just got a, you just got a passage that talks about having a good legacy and finishing strong. And we see this man who wasn't perfect, but by the end of his life, he says, okay, I'm tired of being that guy. I'm going to be this guy. And he, and, he, and he allowed the Lord to work in his life. That's why I said that thing about bearing fruit earlier, abiding Christ, be in God's word every day, be in fellowship, have a prayer life every day, be involved in the church, make church attendance a priority every week. And to be about the kingdom work, get involved in some of the outreaches we have and, and um, the opportunities to grow in our faith and to have fellowship. Uh, use the church, don't use it, but take advantage of the church. It's God's family. But what he really told me too was, um, he says in verse 28, he charged them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers. And then in verse 33, and when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew his feet up into his bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. He's like, this is the last thing I want to say to you guys. And then he was done. And I started thinking about this. This may sound a little morbid, but I don't think it is. Think about your death. What are you going to do? What I mean by that is, have you made any plans? I just started I just start talking to the Lord about that this morning a little bit. I, I, this morning I got up super early and I'm just like, Lord, what are you telling me? 
He's saying, why don't you make some plans to get your kids around and speak to them a little bit before you go? And why don't you make a plan that when you die, when that time happens, this is what you're going to do. And I start thinking about that, you know. I start thinking about Psalm 1. I think Psalm 1, I'm not sitting there like, oh, wow, Pastor Marty's giving us this big old thing. What's, what's happening, you know? I'm just saying, it's in the text, okay? I didn't get some incurable diagnosis, so I'm going to be dead in a week or something, you know? Now, if I die in a week, that would be kind of... Okay, no, no, yeah. So, Psalm 1 is what I want. I want Psalm 1 read at my, at my memorial. Because it talks about the blessed life of not walking in the counsel of the ungodly or the path of the sinners or the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. It says, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. And he will not wither. And whatever he does, he will prosper. But then it goes on to say, not so with the wicked. And it basically just talks about the wicked are not going to inherit the kingdom. They're going to go to judgment. So obviously, I want the gospel preached. And I was thinking about, I'm going to have my son Daniel preach it. He's a pastor. And then my wife says, he might not be ready to preach, so Pastor Rick will do it. You know? But, oh, and here's something, here's something so funny. This is, this, is, this is kind of funny. So years ago, we were talking with our son Daniel. I don't know what we were talking about. Maybe there were some other kids, but we were talking about, you know, when we die. I mean, we're talking like in a morbid place. And, and, uh, and, and something was like, if I go before Lori or Lori goes before me, and uh, one of us said, you know, we're just praying God takes us at the same time. And Daniel goes, that is like the most selfish thing I've ever heard. Are you serious? You're going to take both of you at the same time? Oh, come on. And we just, we just looked at each other like, I, I think he's actually serious, you know? It's like... But it was just kind of funny. I mean, I, I would love to go with her, and I think we'll just all go in the rapture and make it easy on everybody. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, 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 is I want to finish strong, and I'm already thinking about... So I was talking to my, Lord, my, my Lori. <laughs> she is mine, my love, you know, but her name's Lori. So I was talking to her about this, and just saying, honey, so what do you think about this? about what I just said about, hey, you know, share this at the memorial, have, you know, Daniel do it or Rick or whatever. And, and I go, what do you think? And she goes, you know what? I just think we want to share the importance of loving our family and the importance of being intentional and the importance of, of being forgiving. Forgive your family members. Forgive those people. Make things right with those people before you die. We have that opportunity now. And, and often... Um, I'm sure Rick could attest to this and Joe and others that have done memorials. A lot of times you have a memorial and there's friction in a family and they never got things settled. And sometimes they get really bitter and they get angry and they're talking about possessions. It's like, forget all that. You want to just have a clean conscience before God and before each other and don't let it be on your side. So we want to make sure that we try to do our best to make amends with people. But then we want to love people and we want to show them that we care about them. And uh, my wife and I have just been talking lately about trying to be a little more intentional with our kids. You know, I mean, we're doing ministry, and praise God, that's a great thing to do, but you can be so ministry-minded, you can not spend so much time with your family, and I'm, I'm kind of being compelled uh, to just, okay, I just, we just need to be more intentional. So her and I are going to be talking more about, we're going to go out next week, we're going to go visit one of our, our sons in North Dakota. They've lived there for like seven years, and we've only been there like two times, maybe three times. We need to go visit them. And, uh, but anyways, so what am I saying? I'm just saying... Let's be like Jacob. Let's finish strong. Let's use those opportunities to gather with our kids. A lot of times, I've noticed this a lot of times, we'll we'll, we'll gather the kids sometimes. We don't get as much together as much as I'd like. We're kind of all over the place, our kids, so it's really hard to get them all together. But the handful of times, we'll get at least some of them together, and I'll, I'll get them all, and sometimes I'll say, who wants to pray? And one of my two, one of my sons, and one of my son-in-laws, all goes, you the preacher, you pray. And I started thinking about that. You know, I want, I want, I want them to pray. I want them to, but the, what they're saying is, you're the, you're the head of this clan. I want to hear what God put on your heart. And that's what one of my son-in-law said to me a couple times. What has God put on your heart to pray for us? And what is God, and I'm like, you know what? I'm just trying to be Mr. Nice Guy and not push myself, but maybe what the Lord's saying is like, no, you're the patriarch. When you're gone, you're gone. You gone. You, you, you can't say a single word when you're done. So we want to say some things before, and I'm already praying about the things I want to say, but I want, like I said that. Um, so this is my encouragement to all of us. 
This isn't a morbid thought. This is a biblical thought. You heard me read all those things that last, last thing people say, things that are written on people's tombstones, uh, what they think about a legacy. And a lot of people, they just, they just go through the motions. They don't even think about it. But the godly man, the godly woman is intentional. I want to pass on the faith. The most important thing about us is who we know and the faith that we pass on. Because you know what? And that's why I'm definitely going to have the gospel in there. And I want actually them to say something like, you want to see mama and papa? You want to see uh, nana and papa? You want to see Marty and Lori? You need to accept Christ just like they did. That's really the truth. And a lot of people don't want to hear it, but you know what? The truth will set you free. The lies and all that will not set them free. So that's why I want the gospel in there too. And so I pray for all of us that we intentionally try to build some bridges with our family if there's any issues and look for opportunities to speak truth into their life. And, 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 and this is another thing I too, intentional. I called my son once a few years ago in, um, uh, he was back in uh, North Dakota. And we had a really good conversation on the phone. And he goes, Dad, yeah, it was really, it was, yeah, it was really good. And I go, I go, yeah, well, I'll have to call you. He goes, yeah, why don't you call me again? And my initial gut feeling was, well, why don't you call me, you know? <laughs> but as the Holy Spirit just pushed the flesh to the side, he said, you're the spiritual leader of the home. You got to make the initiative. And one thing my wife and I have noticed is if we don't make the call, if we don't make the initiative, a lot of times it won't happen. Now, some family, we have a couple that are, more intentional but we have a lot that are not intentional at all and if we're the godly ones we need to be intentional we need to be an intentional example to them the peacemakers as well as trying to speak truth into their life so as we close i'm just going to share what the gospel message is and then we're going to close in prayer for any of you here that ever think I believe everybody here's a christian but i'm not 100 percent sure my question is, do you know for certain that if you were to die, you'd go to heaven? And if you do, then why? Oh, I'm a good person. Really? You don't get to heaven by being a good person. You go to heaven by putting your faith in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins. Every one of us are sinners. Every one of us have done wrong things. And God is a holy and just God, and he's going to hold you accountable to that. It's called judgment. But he loves you so much, he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for your sins and he rose again from the dead that if you would accept him as your Lord and Savior turn from your sin and follow him you will have eternal life and you'll be a Christian and your guilt will be taken away and you have an assurance waiting for you in heaven that's all you need to do that's it so you can pray that you can see my brother Pastor Rick afterwards you can come see me you can see, my, you can see any of the elders and our wives or you can you could probably ask anybody in this church, how do I get saved? And they'll tell you. It's not, it's not rocket science. You just got to humble yourself and ask for God's forgiveness. So let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this amazing example of Jacob. And Lord, he was not a perfect man like many of us. None of us are perfect. But he finished strong. He knew what was important in the end. And Lord, I pray that we would realize the importance of not only our relationship with you, but of the necessity to be a godly example and to pass on the faith and to use our lives as a living testimony to continue to speak truth into their lives, not beating them over the head with truth, but loving them, talking with them, being intentional and building relationships with our family, Lord. So I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would speak to each one of us of what you would want us to do, Father, to be more like you and to finish strong as Jacob did. So, Lord, we love you, we praise you, we worship you, and we pray that you be magnified and glorified by all we say, think, and do in our lives as we live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll stand up for a closing worship song.
Crashing over me, crashing over me. 
real quickly I was reminded that we have the men's discipleship Thursday I don't know why it slipped my mind but I would love to see all you men out there we encourage each other we're going through a book on humility we have worship we have a time of prayer we have a meal uh, come on out I'd love to see you guys out there uh, and when we close here we're not going to pick up the chairs right away we're gonna about 15 minutes of just some time of uh, prayer and fellowship and then we'll pick up so the Lord bless you the Lord keep you the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you guys. Have a great Sunday.